Hello, welcome to the December 14th, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test, make sure everything is coming through, and then we'll get started in just a moment. Hello, welcome to the December 14th. Okay, sounds like the audio is coming through fine on my monitoring computer. My name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America as a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products, and I'll be the host for your live stream today. I'm presenting from uh, the United States outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could ask, simply type your questions in the chat field and or send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, and we'll be happy to kind of go through as many questions uh, as completely and succinctly as possible. We'll go for about probably about four hours today until or until we run out of questions. Um, we will have an index with timestamps of all the topics discussed in the live stream today, uh, posted several hours after the live stream that you could use to uh, jump to specific topics that may interest you. If you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to get that set up. So we wanna give a special thanks to Jan. Uh, also, um, we have two people that volunteer their time. They're not Steinberg employees that volunteer just to be, to function as moderators. Um, so you want to give a special thanks to Agent K and to Jazz Dude for that. And also another wonderful resource of Steinberg information is collected on the Cubase Nation Discord. And I know that um, Jazz Dude does a lot of work with that, compiling useful information for the community. Uh, when asking questions, if we could try to realize that um, if you don't get an immediate response, it's because it may take me a while to catch up to the questions. So if we could uh, try to refrain from asking the same question repeatedly, it won't get your question answered any faster. Uh, just kind of makes the whole process slower. So if you just ask, ask a question once, if for some reason I lose part of the chat field, I will let people know um, when I lost uh, questions and then you could re-ask, but if we could try to do that. Also when asking questions, if we could try to uh, indicate which operating system, whether you're on a Mac or PC, which level of Cubase, whether it's LE, AI, Elements, Artist Pro, and uh, which version, so whether it's 10, 10.5, or 11, that information will be helpful. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so we see, uh, and also if you're attending the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. All right, so we see Randy Lee uh, from Texas, great to see you on. And we have Tabri videos uh, from Germany. Um, he's on, so welcome. All right, so question, uh, when used for parallel compression, what is the difference between the direct summing mode and a traditional aux bus group or effects track. Um, so, you know, really when we're gonna be using uh, the, so let's say if we go to our mix console, one of the things that is available within the racks is a direct routing mode. So we could send to multiple destinations here in a parallel manner if we just go to this little i this little drop down menu and turn on direct routing summing mode on then we could send to multiple destinations now it's really kind of in essence doing the same thing as using your sends um and the reason that it's available is that, you know, if you wanted to send to multiple destinations, you may be using all of all eight effect sends in a, in a complex mix for like your reverbs, delays, flangers, chorusing, and other effects. So this gives you kind of another set of destinations that could be used independent of the send effects. The functionality will be the same but it just gives you another option in case you're already using all of your effect sends on a particular track and still need to send it out to multiple destinations for parallel processing. And that's why they have the direct routing mode as well. 
All right. So we see Matt Ellis, Matthew Elston checking in from London. We have Robbie Bowling from Dallas. We have Uno Memento from Finland where it's snowing. All right. And it's also, we see Terminal Nuclear War. It's snowing in Serbia. And we don't have any snow reports in the UK. Uh, all right. So we have Benny from Sweden. All right, so we just see a question uh, from Benny. Uh, is it not possible to color the tracks on the mixer console? I have Nuendo 10. I could do it in Cubase 11. So I think it came kind of in 10.5 uh, Cubase. So it might only be in, I can't, I don't think that there was a 10.5 of Nuendo, but to set it up, uh, if you wanted to colorize the mixed console channels, so it may not have been in Nuendo 10, but it may have been first introduced in Nuendo 11. But it, if you have the latest version that might have some of the, I think there was a 10.3 that might have the capability um, or whatever the latest version of the 10 product lifecycle is. But to set that up, we would go to your preferences um, let me see if I even, I may have a Nuendo 10 still installed. So I have a Nuendo 10.3 and I'll just open it up and take a look just to make sure. Just get this going. Okay, so I'll colorize my channels here. Okay, so in 10.3, we'll come over here to Nuendo Preferences, Track and Mix Console Channels. So if we come over here, go to the Mix Console Channels, and and doesn't look like we just hit apply. So as you can see now, we can just have the mixed console channel. So make sure that you have Nuendo 10.3 at least installed. And it looks like it is available. All right, so we see Jan from Stockholm. All right. Um, Okay, so I just see after seeing a competitor solution, I'd like to ask if it'd be possible to see a demo of Steinberg's VST Transit. Uh, also, and ask if collaboration can be done in real time. Can it make notes? It's not really intended for real time. So if we come over here to the VST Transit, is more like we want to be able to, uh, you know, download particular projects. Let's see if I can. So, you know, if I wanted to come over here, we could upload, you know, particular projects. Uh, so you can set kind of your profile. And this is a function that's in Cubase, but not in Nuendo. Uh, but if you want it to, you know, come over here, we could just say, okay, I want it to take uh, this particular project and be able to share it with different friends. And then you could actually see, um, you know, different. So at, at this point, we could just take this particular project and share it. It's not really intended for kind of a dynamic, uh, real time uh, collaboration to share parts of the project. So, but you know, you can do some of that with Nuendo uh, 
within its network collaboration. So that way you could actually take notes. So that's a, one of the distinction distinctions of Cubase over Nuendo for that. All right, so we see David checking in. We have John Costigan. We have Soren from Sweden. We have uh, Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. Thanks for joining. All right, we see Jazz Dude on the live stream. We see The Cube, Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. All right, and Tim wants everyone to hit the like button early today. Uh, so I see John Tobin just saying, um, yeah, I, I will send off the email again about the VST Connect, but I think we did go over it on the last live stream as well. So, but I'll make sure to resend it. Sorry, I didn't get a chance to resend that to you. All right, we have Dallas LaRue from Las Vegas. <clears throat> Dan Freeman from Atlanta. All right. We have Studio LB checking in from Austin, one of my favorite cities. All right, we have Mitch Michelle checking in from Michigan. Trond checking in from Norway. Michael Pierce from outside of London. All right, so we just see from uh, Dallas LaRue, sometimes the listen function in control room doesn't always shut off the other track. So one thing to check with that, so let's say if I'm here and I wanted to do kind of a listen on the bass, is just go to the control room and you may have to click on the main tab here. If you click on the main tab, maybe the listen dim level is set to zero. So if I come here, and click on listen, you don't notice it. So make sure that you have your listen dim level set. So just adjust a slider there. And see if that makes a difference for you. So you could just come right over here to the listen dim. So you'd see that if you don't see that initially, just click on main and then you'll see the listen dim and then just drag that down by several dB. And I think a lot of times when people tell me that it's not working, it's this is set to zero dB. And I think it defaults to kind of the same value uh, to zero dB. So. Okay, so we just see a question um, from Jay from Connecticut. Uh, with the coming transition out of eLicenser, are there any uniform uh, license transition strategies for third-party products on USB dongle like Vienna Ensemble Pro licenses? So I think a lot of the companies have already in the process of migrating. You know, there's one company that kind of, uh, you know, erroneously kind of sent an email out before the official announcement and you know, as you know, which is, I think might have been an attempt to get a bunch of people to update to a later version. So, um, but you know, it, it's kind of up to the third party products, you know, again, if it's on the USB e licensor, it'll still work. Um, so, but it's really up to how the different companies are transitioning. All right, so we have FAA Recording Studio checking in from Bangladesh. Thanks for joining us. And we have Rain from Germany. All right, uh, so we have a question from Thomas Young. Can you go over System Link? I use Cubase 11 Pro. So do, the original intention of VST System Link, which we could set by going into the studio setup, and then we'll see um, our VST System Link setup here is that you know like the old days if you wanted 48 tracks of like analog tape you would synchronize two tape machines if you wanted 72 tracks you would synchronize three tape machines so we figured you know especially when this was generated 20 years ago that you know maybe 22 years ago ish that 
what could happen is if one computer ran out of processing power, that we could have another computer kind of like an kind of like, you know, very similar in concept to an analog tape machine. And we could connect a digital audio connection like a SPDIF cable, uh, an ADAT light pipe, a um, or an AES-EBU, something like that, between the two computers, and the two computers could sample accurately synchronize. So that was kind of the original intention. Then it kind of morphed into also sending MIDI data to another computer and having the MIDI, having the audio from that MIDI data to just simply uh, be sent back. So we could use the other computer as a, you know, almost like a VST instrument rack. And there was a software called VST Rack, which was kind of designed just to host VST instruments. Um, so over the years, you know, computers have gotten faster and a lot of people don't have, you know, it's very common in the early days to have different uh, audio interfaces that had digital connections. So a lot of people have USB connections and, you know, just analog two ins and two outs. So, you know, this works over an actual digital audio connection. So it hasn't been as used recently. So a lot of people will also use it and you could use kind of any version of Cubase. I think even Cubase LE AI will have VST system link capability. A lot of composers use it so that they could, and when you're doing this synchronization, it's sample accurate. So, you know, and that's that, that was a pretty significant thing in a day just to make sure that we could sample accurately sync uh, computers together, which is really critical for digital audio, not be reliant upon uh, the frame rate or, you know, of the SMPTE time code to be the basis or the word clock. So at this point, we could sample accurately sync. So when most people use it today is they may have one copy of Cubase that's running the video and they will system link that, synchronize the video playback in one instance of Cubase and one computer that's hosting the video and one computer that's just synchronizing to it. So as people are using VST system link, it's when I see it being used now, it's mostly for composers that want to have the video offloaded onto a separate computer and yet still have sample accurate synchronization without buying a lot of external hardware to accomplish that. Okay, so we have a question it says, uh, when using chord track, is it possible to have a key change mid tune, uh, i.e. Uh, change up semitones for a remainder of tune? All right, so let's come over here, I'll just add a chord track. All right, we'll make this a little larger for everyone to see. Okay, so let's say we have this chord progression and I've duplicated this a couple of times. So let's say, okay, we're gonna start it here. Uh, but the third time I just wanted these chords to modulate up. All you have to do is to select. So let's say I wanted to go up a major second. I could just select those particular chords and we see from the info line here, uh, we can see root key and then all you have to do is come over here and just say, okay, we want to make it into D and then we could just modulate just like that. So select the chords here and then you could just uh, adjust the root key here to do transpositions and modulations. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, if I have one instance of contact with multiple MIDI tracks and I want to render one MIDI track, uh, Cubase tries to render all of the tracks even though they do not have any data on it. So, you know, Cubase, when you do it through a MIDI track, um, you know, what's going to happen is, you know, Cubase knows where the MIDI is going out, but it doesn't necessarily know what 
you know, what outputs are being used. So if you use instrument tracks for that, then it knows to complete signal routing of the audio capabilities. So, you know, with MIDI tracks, you know, we send the MIDI out, but there's no correlation to what's going, what output, you know, Cubase doesn't necessarily know what output the instrument is sending it to, where as an instrument track, and it's one of the benefits of using instrument tracks, it will automatically allow you to just take, um, you know, and have one part rendered uh, very easily using that. So try using instrument tracks instead of MIDI tracks. All right, so we see Roland Gerard checking in. Thanks for joining. All right, and we have Panos checking in from Greece. Okay, so we see from uh, John says, uh, okay, VST Connect Pro all up and running except QSENS not heard by VST Performer end. Uh, Talkback working fine. Um, so let's say if I wanted to come over here to my VST Connect Pro. Um, I don't have the other computer to connect to. Um, just. Yeah, I don't have the uh, another computer hooked up to really kind of. Just see if I can. I don't have my password typed in here. Um, but I could, if you want to email me offline again, John, I'd be happy to kind of, there's one little thing that it might be. Um, but I don't have my other computer set up where I could get it configured to show easily. Sorry about that. All right, so we see, uh, does Cubase create a log file on Mac and PC? So there is like a usage logger. Um, and I think if you wanted to go to preferences, um, and let me just see if we could, I think there might be under like a, just might be a preference, but there is like a login, a usage logger that could kind of tell you what happens before and after if there is, uh, kind of a system instability. Okay, so if you go to uh, preferences to general, you could enable uh, the usage logger. So you could just kind of click here and this will kind of tell you uh, more about the usage logging. So So again, just come over here to uh, preferences, go to general and go to usage logger options and enable usage logging. chat field just kind of jumped. Okay. Let me find my place again. All 
Okay, um, so we see a question. Um, does Nuendo 11 getting an update when Cubase 12 will be released? So, you know, generally, you know, how it's worked in the past, and it used to be like they were very separated and they would take, you know, the new features that were introduced in Cubase and Nuendo has other features so that it would take more time for them to implement the new features in Nuendo because it was not at only adding the newer Cubase features, but other uh, specific Nuendo features. Um, so... So, you know, I imagine shortly after Cubase 12 will be released, what's happened in the past is there will be kind of a Nuendo update. Uh, I think the last few years, it's been like a month or two afterwards, but the next version of Nuendo hasn't been announced. Okay, uh, so we see a question from Dan Freeman, uh, page 399 of the manual, setting up direct routing. Point three talks about the widest channel and channel width. Uh, can you describe what that means? Is it for surround only? So yes, it is for surround. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you're working in stereo, or mono or stereo or 5.1, or if you're doing even, you know, more extensive surround, like a 714 innuendo, you could just simply use that. So that's what it means by the channel width. All right. All right, so we have Pablo Vasquez from Galicia, España. Glad you can make the live stream. Okay, so we see, um, I find it, question, uh, I find it difficult to do remixes in Cubase because the BPM analysis isn't always correct and I find it difficult to link audio to MIDI BPM. Any tips? Okay, so we'll just try here with a quick project. So I'll just say if I want to do like a quick remix, um, I'll do something horribly musically inappropriate. All right, so let's say I have a jazz piece here that's not following the click. So I'm gonna select it, go to my tempo detection. Now you have some different options here. So if you wanted to do like an offbeat correction, Now, as we work with this, we may notice that as we've done a tempo detection that, you know, it will automatically place the signature. It's kind of figuring out what the beats are and it will place it into a meter of one four. So you may have to define kind of where the downbeat is in the project. But, you know, once you've done the tempo detection, it's set up so that, you know, once, uh, you know, we close this window, we're in the tempo warp so as you listen to it you can just come over here and the tempo the you know we we see our time warp tool is active and what this is going to allow us to do is just to say oh this is where the downbeat is here and we could make changes and have that automatically applied you know and it will do a reanalysis from that point on so it kind of takes you into the tool where you could automatically make tweaks if necessary. So it puts you into that mode, but you may have to, you know, make sure you define a downbeat. Like here we have some pickup notes. I could say, you know, measure four, start to measure, the downbeat is right there. So as we do this, and if I wanted to just kind of drag different loops in, um, so let's say, just so say I just want to drag that in so now once I've dragged this loop I could select it and put it into 
uh, musical mode. So once this event is selected, we could place it into musical mode. And as this is speeding up and slowing down, that, you know. That now this loop is automatically following because it's in musical mode. That it's automatically following. So I just make copies here. So this loop is dynamically following the tempo of the tracks. And if I wanted to take like a MIDI loop in as well, so let's say, okay, I just want to come over here, find maybe percussion or something like that. Which would be MIDI. We'll get the instrument loaded up here. Okay, so now when I drag this over, um, this MIDI will automatically line up as well. So we'll just. So let's say if I wanted to come here and put like a little flanger on it. that works really well but you know if you you know listen to the tempo detection you know it does a really great job but you know it puts you into the time warp mode so that you could make changes and tweak it if necessary so all right um so you see, what is an optimal way to take a score slash file created in Dorco for the iPad and bring it into Cubase Pro? So I believe you could just simply export it. Um, you know, there's two different methods. I believe that you could export it. I haven't personally tried this, but as a uh, MIDI file, um, and that would get all of the notes over with the controller data. If you wanted to carry over like, you know, the slurs and the graphic appearance, more of like a picture of it, at that point, you could uh, uh, export it as a music XML and import it. You'd probably have better, uh, if you wanted it to play back, uh, you probably have you know better options for exporting a MIDI file and importing that directly into Cubase. All right, um, all right, so we have Omar checking in from France. Uh, okay, so I just see guessing, I know the answer to this, but is there a way to make .lv2 plugins work in Cubase 11? Um, I'm not sure if that's a Ableton, maybe a live uh, plugin format, but you know, if it's not a VST plugin, it's not going to, uh, work in Cubase, so it would need to be a you. Uh, it would need to be a um, a VST plugin. So, okay. Uh, so we have a question. Um, how do you make the best usage of supervision during production? So a lot of times when I'm kind of just working on stuff, you know, I may have. Let's say as we're just kind of listening, you know, so. And I wanted to just open up my supervision. So I'll just pop over here to my inserts. So, yeah. 
So a lot of times, you know, I, people I know will have kind of like constant meters going on for frequencies, but also a lot of phase anomalies. So let's say if I wanted to come here, I think I even have just a, a preset that I made, you know, some of my best audio engineer friends are just constantly kind of hypersensitive to phase. So you want to make sure that you don't have a lot of frequencies here. If we see these kind of below the axis, like we see some of these, that would indicate that we have phase in phase problems in particular frequencies. Um, so if you see this kind of like, you know, being just straight vertical, or we see it kind of going off at angles following the axis here, that would give you a sense that there's gonna be phase problems. So, you know, I know people constantly when they're, you know, will just have a separate screen, you know, just to monitor phase, frequencies, levels. Uh, so, you know, one of the presets I made is just, um, I call it my control room view. And in my personal studio, I just have this on its own monitor constantly. So I could just kind of look at it to see what my loudness is, the levels. If I have any frequency things, like, okay, there's probably too much low end going on. My phase looks okay. I can check different relationships. So all of those things are really helpful for kind of during production. Um, you know, and I know many old school engineers have an RTA and a phase scope that just sit on their console and they just are constantly looking at that, looking for any problems that might creep up into the production. So. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so we had a question. Can you show how composers generally use process tempo and why? Okay, so I'll just do, let's say I have my tempo here and I want it to, okay, so I'll just kind of select Okay, so let's say at this point, you know, like I need it, let's say, okay, I want my bar range uh, to be, you know, mine, let's say I want it to be 21 bars, um, that at this point, you know, you could kind of just take different, I haven't worked with this in a while, um, So let's say, okay, I need like, I need these eight bars, uh, but I need the length to be, you know, my, I need the length between those eight bars to be, you know, let's say nine seconds as opposed to 13 seconds. So now when I hit process, um, and we can see that this will now, let me just, set the range here that that will allow us to see to process like the different tempo ranges so if i needed to kind of keep this tempo curve but i needed that to automatically fit and maintain that tempo and that tempo relationship but i needed it to be a different amount of time so let's say someone cut out six seconds and i need a scene that was 14 seconds to be eight seconds long. I could type in the new length and hit process and that will fix the tempo changes for you. Okay, so I just see uh, when I'm using short keys, uh, so it's the question when I'm using short keys to switch tracks or start and stop and other various keyboard moves, uh, it seems to also change the screen size and open different things like the sends and other functions. Um, 
All right, so, you know, one of the things, you know, so it could be depending on what the active window is. Um, so like, you know, sometimes people can, um, you know, depending like, let's say if you're in the mixer, a, a keyboard shortcut may have a different function. If this is the active window versus the project window being the active window. Um, so it could be something like that with the navigation keys to kind of mitigate this. I think that there is a preference that you may want to check. Um, so I think it's maybe under editing, like up down navigation keys uh, for selecting tracks only. So that may be something to check and that's a preference under editing and see if maybe that changes it. But if you could let us know, like if there's particular keys that are functions that are popping up all the time that um, that you're accidentally triggering, we might be able to trace it back. Okay, so we see uh, Nanu uh, says upgraded to Cubase Artist yesterday. So congratulations. They also got the Arturia Mini Mark II as well. Okay, so I just see uh, from Nanu, uh, how do I show the keys on the step editor, like E, C, F sharp, et cetera, without mouse over? Um, so let's say if I'm here on this particular part. Um, all right, so here we could see, like I think it's maybe the labels on a key. So let's say if I just zoom vertically, so depending on the vertical height of the parts so if i hit like shift g if they're kind of the vertical zoom is very small we don't see the pitch indicated but as it gets bigger we could see the pitch indicated when it's kind of a little larger so see if that makes sense uh, let me know if that's what you're looking for if not just let me know Okay, so we see a uh, question. Is there a way to have different mix versions within the same project, like a vocal up version and a vocal down version? Um, so if you have uh, different projects here, I, what I know some people do is, let me just open up uh, something with vocals in it here. All right, so if you don't have, um, let's say if you don't have a l automation going on, this could be quickly done using kind of mixed console snapshots. So I could say, okay, I wanna take the vocal here. I could take a snapshot. Um, so mixed console snapshots, you know, won't necessarily include automation because it is just kind of a static representation. So, so let's say I want that and then I could do another snapshot so let's say okay this is uh, a different snapshot so i could do that and i could also say okay let's take a snapshot here and now we could choose to just navigate between the different snapshots so some people will do that now a lot of people will have automation and that may not be so practical uh, and another method to do kind of like different vocal ups, vocal downs is to just, you know, if I wanted to take this, uh, I could use track versions. So I'll say new version and we'll say up one DB. So let's say, uh, first off, what I want to do is I'll just duplicate that version 
And then I could just come here and say, okay, we want to make the vocal up one dB. And I could duplicate this version. And I'll call this down one dB. All right. So now as I kind of switch between these different takes, I can say, okay, there's that one. Here's down one dB. Here is up one dB. So you could just kind of switch uh, just between different edits, just like that. So that's that's another way of doing it. Some people will just you know uh, take if there's extensive automation. You know they may just come here. And so let's say we have a bunch of automation going on, and they may. You know, before they, you know, duplicate tracks, they may just have three different vocals with, you know, and mute two of the vocals. So, you know, depending on the scenario, look at snapshots, track versions, or just simply duplicating tracks. And that way you could have everything within one project. Many people will still just have a different project, you know, vocal up one dB, a different project vocal down one dB. But if you wanted to kind of consolidate it all within here, you could duplicate, use track versions or snapshots, depending on the amount of automation you have going on a project. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, are there disadvantages to use the musical mode you know, so if you do extreme changes with musical mode, you may hear some artifacts. Like if you take a, a loop that's at 120 beats a minute and play it at 30 beats a minute, it's gonna, you know, it may sound a little bit sonic. The sonic integrity might be affected, but if you want the audio to fit into and follow the project time and the project tempo, uh, then, you know, musical mode is the way to do it. So if you need to make an audio that's a different tempo or different speed fit into an, another project, you know, musical mode is the best way to do it. All right, so we just see question, do you guys give private lessons? So yeah, I've been hired by people to teach them Cubase stuff, but, but I'm sure there's lots of people who do that. All right, so we just see, will Cubase ever add live looping into the program? Um, so, you know, we can't really speculate on new features that will be coming, but it, you know, so, but we'll pass it on as a feature request. But you know, there's many different, different definitions of what live looping is. Maybe if you could uh, let us know what you want to do, if you want to have one part to kind of play independently, you know, we could do stuff like, okay, if I want to take like this little Mellotron part and have this kind of loop, Um, that we could come over here and I think that there is a special, so if we go to the independent uh, track loop, okay, so now as we apply, So now you could just have this part. So um, let me just set this here on. So let's say if I have this off and we're playing. But you could just kind of come right over here. Um, and you could have like just an independent, let me see if I remember how to get this set up. So 
So now we could have this, that MIDI part just constantly. So if you wanted to just have one part, So, so that way you could do one part that's continually looping live while you do other stuff. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. Hey guys, I'm from the UK. I wanted to know how to record with compression in Cubase. I work with 10.5, is it even possible? So when you go to the mix console, you'll probably have uh, like your input channels. So if you want it to record with compression, you can go to the input channels where you have the source. Uh, and at that point you could just put, you know, the channel strip add compression here. And this way you could actually record with the channel compression on as the file is being recorded. So you, it gets recorded through this plugin if it's on the input channels, but realize that a lot of people don't necessarily want to do that. Um, you know, sometimes it's intended, uh, but a lot of times, you know, it's kind of, you can't take it off after the fact. So it's being processed live through there. But you know, if you wanted to monitor while you're recording with compression, you could do that, but you may have to make sure that when you get to your Studio menu to studio setup and select your audio interface that you have direct monitoring turned off. But if you wanted to print compression or EQ to the audio file as it's recorded, just simply put the plug in on the input channel and then you'll be all set. All right, so I see, uh, what Cubase version is this? So I'm running 11.041. Cubase Pro. My chat field jumped. Okay, so our next question, um, is there any way to add a, an effect to a specific part of a song, for instance, a dub style delay in the middle of a song only? So let's say if I'm here and I just wanted to add like a, a reverb, just so let's say if I'm here, uh, let me just jump back to my So let's say I just want to take this, oh, let me just revert it since I've destroyed my, it's such a good song. I don't want to do that to Vince and tarnish it for Sable's upcoming version. All right, so let's say I wanted to just put. So let's say in that little ad lib phrase, I just wanted to put a, like a delay. So I'm gonna come here, uh, I'll select the range here. So it's like, okay, I want that delay to kind of cascade, to cascade here. And then if we go to direct, off, so if that's selected, I could go to direct offline processing or just go to the plugins and I'll say, I uh, just wanted to put a little mono, or I'll just put a delay on it. So now. Just leave it alone. Oh. All right, 
right? So we just do that again. So I'll just come here to plugins, uh, default delay, and I'll say mono delay, and we'll make it just a, a dotted quarter delay. So as we do this, and we could add a tail size if we want to. So just leave it alone. So at that point, we could just monitor and we could just process just that delay. You know, you could also, if you wanted to do just automate an effects end, you could do that as well. Uh, but with this at any time, like, you know, 10 years later, I could just delete that particular uh, process or replace it or augment it with other processes. So just try selecting what you want to apply. And then I could just say, okay, I want it to do here, just get an audio plugins and I'll just say, okay, I want a delay. Let's make it a multi-tap delay and I'll just, let's, um, so now with just that on. And let's say, as I do this now, So then when you just select the event, you know, you're able to just come right over here and undo that particular processing. So if you just want on a part, you could just put your delays and have it kind of embedded into parts as well. All right, so we have a question. How can you maximize the amount of RAM that is uh, used to stream virtual instruments? So a lot of times it's gonna be in the instrument itself. So if I wanted to, let's say if I go to my instrument rack, um, you know, if we go to Groove Agent, you know, most of these will be uh, similar areas. So, you know, if we have a lot of RAM, we could say we could adjust kind of our maximum preload amount. And if we're in Halion, we could come over here again to options and we could set kind of the maximum preload amount and we could kind of even set a balance between how much is streamed from disk versus RAM. But if you have more uh, memory available, you could just increase that maximum preload. So that's how you could kind of organize your memory usage. So it's gonna be, generally on an instrument by instrument basis. Apparently I impressed Pablo, but I don't know what I did, so. But we're glad you're impressed, so. Good drum part on the last uh, San Antonio. Enjoyed playing that, so. All right, so we see, uh, is the stream delayed? Sometimes I don't see the questions. So the uh, my ability to keep up in real time with questions is always a challenge. So uh, so sometimes it might be like, you know, at time, sometimes 20 to 30, sometimes 40 minutes. Uh, uh, by time I get to questions that were asked, there's obviously a big splurge of questions that were um, that are asked at the beginning and I try to catch up. All right, so we see Cubase Junkie, um, that it's his birthday. So happy birthday, everyone wish Cubase Junkie a happy birthday. And Pablo has granted him a new Oz controller by Yamaha, so that's good. I miss having mine. Okay, so we just see, uh, hey from Memphis, how difficult will it be to update to 12, more registration, et cetera, or will it be easy with the download assistant? So I think it's gonna be very streamlined, uh, you know, with the new license management and using the download assistant. So 
Uh, but we haven't, it obviously hasn't been implemented yet and we can make something really easy and, you know, there's always people that will do it the wrong way, regardless of how many FAQs we provide so, or videos. So we see from Steven, uh, so it says, hi, Greg, using Cubase, is there any way I can normalize myself so I can get a girlfriend and leave you alone? You got the best offering on the web with these help sessions. Merry Christmas. So thank you for that. So, but just, just keep, keep watching and you'll be so successful that all the girls will want to date you. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, it says, I use Free Warp tool to align many vocals as tight as possible, uh, but when I open the Cubase project again, some changes do not persist, some do. Uh, tried flatten or balance, uh, same problem, please help. Um, so I haven't run into any instances where my Free Warp um, changes have, you know, have, not persisted uh i'll show you something that you might want to be able to do is let's say you know if i just come here all right so you know a lot of times you know when i'm doing like pretty complex editing you know at that point i may do you know, uh, different track versions so that I could always jump back quickly. So if I wanted to take all of these, um, so let's say I could just do a duplicate version. And let's say if I do kind of all of my uh, editing on this particular one, so let's say if I just have now double clicked and I'm in free warp, and I'm putting in my warp markers here. So let's say. So let's say I just put this in so I can move these around, but I haven't had any of these, you know, not to be kept. And I've done kind of a lot of free warp editing recently. Um, but you know, but once you have it, it's kind of like a different track version. So maybe at this point, if, you know, if you've done a lot of editing, you know, maybe it's just to duplicate versions and then you could always, you know, go back to the original to, you know, and this will stay, save kind of a different instance. But if you have like a particular project that you're noticing, and sometimes I've seen where people, you know, will copy a background vocal and maybe take one recording and pan it, um, you know, left and you know, like hard left and hard right, but it's the same file, but it's duplicated here. And then when they do warping on a file um, that, you know, maybe as they do warping, depending on the editing preference um, of, so if we go to editing audio and there's a preference for uh, on processing shared clips that you create new versions. So I've seen some people that will do different editing on, you know, what is the same file and get conflicting results with that. So that's something where, you know, it's, you know, you, you copy this over and you do editing, but it's the same file that you're kind of warping that it's not creating a new version. So that may be something to check is this preference. But if you have a particular project that you find that happening to, please feel free to send it to me at clubcubase at steinberg.de.
Okay, so we just see, uh, is there a question, is there a way to manually fine tune an audio track to uh, MIDI beat? You know, so one of the things that you could do is, you know, if we have, let me just create something here real quick. I'll just find a quick MIDI loop. All right, so let's say, you know, if I have, you know, a, let's just, all right, so let's say if I have like, you know, this particular pattern and I want it to apply, if we go to the quantize panel, I could drag this in and now when I come over here, if I have this quantize set up, we could just now hit Q on the audio file and that will, and it was pretty subtle here, but if I just want it to now, when I hit Q on this audio file, we'll see that it will shift based upon the timing of the MIDI part. So that's one way of doing it, you know, and you could also just always come over here and as you do kind of the warping, we could just say, okay, I want to put this warp point here and you could kind of manually align stuff as well, but try just taking the MIDI stuff and drag it into the quantize panel and that will make a groove preset. And then from there, you could apply that to other audio files, to other audio files. Okay, so it says, uh, we have a question. Uh, hello, everybody, I spotted fault that I don't understand. How to how set tick sync to my Cubase tempo? Uh, I have set project tempo to 125 BPM, but the click is not in sync with this tempo when I hear it. Um, okay, so let's I'll just do new project. Okay, so let's say we're at 120 BPM, and as we play. Okay, so let's say. So if I go to 144, sorry. So, you know, I wonder if there's a, let's say if we have a tempo track. All right, so let's say I'll just, let's say we now have, I'll activate my tempo track and let's say, Okay, so let's say, you know, if you have this set, maybe to, you know, so if the tempo track is deactivated, it will not follow the tempo changes, but you still kind of see it. Um, one thing to check is, let's say, if we go to uh, your click patterns, you can make sure that you know, you don't have kind of like an odd click pattern where maybe it's just, you know, sounding like in quintuplets or something like that. But generally, you know, whatever the metronome is set to, it'll follow. But if you have a tempo track, you could have it follow the tempo track or have it not follow the tempo track depending on what you have activated here so check some of those things 
See, Pablo is indicating every song needs at least one shaker track. Once you add a shaker, it's it's quote unquote produced. All right. All right, so Cubase uh, Junkie wants people to like the video, so make sure you hit that. And it's his birthday, so we'll have to comply. Okay, so we see what is the best workflow to create drum maps? So once we have um, an instrument part, you know, so let's say if I have Groove Agent SE here, um, now if you have Groove Agent SE and we have a kit loaded up, so let's say if I come over here, Groove Agent SE is smart enough to automatically export the drum map name. So if we can go to our drum part here, so if it's a Groove Agent SE, we could say drum map from instrument and that will automatically carry over all of the different kick sounds and all the different sounds from Groove Agent will automatically be uh, extracted. So Groove Agent is smart that way, but if I wanted to make my own drum maps, I would go to drum map setup. And here you could just enter into pitch, uh, you know, the name of the drum, and then you could just kind of go down and enter in your names. And then when you go to functions here, that's where you could save that as a drum map that could be loaded uh, in independently or saved within the track preset. So once again, just come over here, you'll see from the top inspector tab, you'll see um, drum map setup and there's where you could do it. All right, so we have Michael Teams checking in from Weatherford, Texas. Now I believe the virtual ice cream will start. All right, so we see a New Year's wish from Pablo, just saying, I wish that Steinberg did not stop the development of supervision. So I don't think Steinberg stopped the development. You know, it was just introduced in version 11 and there hasn't been a new feature, like a new version since, but you know, there hasn't been a new Cubase version as well. So, so don't assume that it's the development is stopped. All right. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, if I have a long MIDI note in an event and I shorten that event, not cut, uh, the sound keeps playing when the playhead goes past the event. Uh, is there an option to disable this? All right, so you just. I'll just load up a quick patch here.
All right, so we'll play this back and it's gonna play for two measures. All right, so I think if we now shorten the event that as we look at the note here, and I'll just synchronize this view that, you know, once we shorten the event, that what's going to happen is the event still has the same, you know, we've shortened the event, but the MIDI note hasn't been shortened. So when we play back, it'll still sound um, because, you know, it's that note has already been kind of picked for like a start and end point. Uh, I think if we come over here to editing preferences to MIDI. And if we choose to split the MIDI event here, with this option. So now if I cut and erase that, it'll now split the note based on our cut. But with, you know, if we're just resizing it that way, you know, it's going to be maintained otherwise, um, regardless of the size of the container. So the events can exist outside of the container if necessary. So maybe instead of if you wanted to split the notes instead of resizing it, maybe consider splitting and erasing. Um, but I'll kind of pass that along as a feature request as well so that development team is aware of it. But but there is a way if you split the event that you choose to split the note. But the container could be, you know, like I don't necessarily want, uh, you know, if I had other notes that if you wanted to just extend that back to see what was originally in there, all those events are there, but you're just kind of choosing for that MIDI note to maintain its off position, so. All right, you see Pablo's very happy to get ice cream from Michael Teams. See, uh, Chris Hallam is just saying, uh, one of the reasons I returned to Cubase is because of Dorco is a longtime Sibelius user. I find Dorco brilliant. Uh, excited to see how Cubase and Dorco interact in the years to come. So, yeah, I think there's lots of wonderful things going on with both teams, and we're glad to have you as a Cubase and Dorco user. All right, we see from Cubase Drunky just saying shout out to Steinberg. Cubase are always keeping uh, their DAW professional, not going the easy route just to draw in people that's not dedicated to music. Yeah. We want everyone to be able to use Cubase as well. Okay, so we have a question it just says, uh, if I have a track with a compressor on it and it's side chained to another track, I want to copy that compressor over uh, to entirely new track. Is there a way to have the side chain copy with it? No, this, the connection of the side chain uh, doesn't follow the plugin, but the side chain goes to the particular track. So it's not necessarily following the plugin, but it's going this it's a it's a routing to a destination is what the side chain is doing so uh just to show this you know let's say if i have i'll add two audio tracks or i'll add three Okay, so say we have this uh, track. So now if I go to 
my inserts and I do compressor. And we wanted it to side chain to say audio 01. You know, what's actually kind of maintained when we, let's say if I come over here to my mix console and if I copy this plugin, you know, the side chain is, we just, the right keyboard shortcut sorry about that all right so say if i copy this over the side chain is going to be you know again kind of based on you know the, the side chain. it's not necessarily going to the plugin but it's going to this particular destination so that's why it's not copied over which makes kind of sense from a a routing standpoint that you know if I just wanted to copy this over I don't necessarily want the side chaining but you could again set up the side chaining quite easily but you know think of the side chaining as being a path uh, to a destination and not the path to the plug-in All right, so we have Rob checking in from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Thanks for joining the live stream. All right, so I just see a uh, so question. I purchased uh, Cubase Elements for my nephew and tried to explain Spectral Layers 1 to him. He doesn't know what I'm talking about, and there is no version specification in the charts. Is it specific? So I'm not sure if Elements comes with Spectral Layers 1. Let's go take a look just to make sure. So I'll just come over here to the Download Assistant. Yeah, so the the you know Cubase uh, elements doesn't come with Spectral Layers one. Uh, let's see if Cubase Artist does, or if it's it might just be a Cubase Pro and Nuendo. Yeah, so I think it's just going to be Cubase Pro that comes with it. So that may be why your nephew might be giving you. Uh, strange looks. So let's just. Yeah, so the spectral layer is one. All right, let's see if it's. Uh, it comes in artist as well. But yeah, not in elements. Okay, just seeing some discussion from Matt Elder. Let me see if I can pick it up. Um, it's great to see Mark Rabin on the live stream as well. Okay, sorry you missed this. Um, says so. Question: uh, I have, I'm having trouble with the audio warp tabs. Some tracks I can use, and the orange lines appear. But in other tracks, it does not work. It doesn't turn orange to show it's active. Thank you. All right, so let's say, um, all right, so I'll just kind of drag a loop over quickly. Okay. 
Okay, so now when I come here and so let's say if I go to my audio warp and free warp, um, so, you know, sometimes often if we go to, you know, it, it could depend upon, it might depend upon the hit points as well, but let's say if I'm here and I double click, I'm in sample editor uh, and we go to hit points. So try just to come here, you know, so sometimes when you record in, Cubase can automatically detect hit points uh, and you know, so that's a preference, but if you come over here, we can say, let's create, you know, so right now I go to audio warp, uh, and this may have changed slightly. Like if we come over here and place it into uh, musical mode, but you know, try going to hit points and then create warp markers. And then when you go to audio warp, then you could see, you should see all the warp markers available. Sometimes you could also generate these just by, you know, if you quantize and enable audio warp here uh, from the quantize panel, that those can show up as well. But it could be depending on if the audio file, you know, is something that was imported. You know, again, Cubase will by default do hit point detection, like, you know, as the audio file is being recorded. But if you're just kind of dragging a file in, you may have to set the hit points and turn those into warp markers. Um, so you can see, I just see a question, uh, is there any plan to make public beta versions of Steinberg products like Cubase? So, you know, there is a testing process that goes on. Um, so I haven't heard of any plans for public betas. I know that we have done it in the past and didn't find it. So, um, and you know, everyone thought it would be a wonderful thing and kind of the, the comments that we got weren't very applicable for testing purposes and sometimes you know doing testing isn't like you know getting access to features but it's kind of just you know checking out it's it could be a, a much different process than what people think it is so uh, but I haven't heard of any plans for public beta versions So we just see a comment. Uh, okay. Um, so we just see a question. Uh, should I get a single 29 inch ultra wide monitor or two 27 inch monitors for a Cubase project window? Um, you know, it's really a personal preference. I like having two monitors. I've just kind of have done that for years or I have a mixed console and editors on one and a project window on another. But if you could organize um, like kind of a, if it's an ultra wide, you might be able to, you know, basically have two different uh, screen, you know, two different screens on one single screen if it kind of matches the resolution. You know, I like having two monitors also because I do have a 5.1 monitoring system. Uh, and for many years, I would just have the center channel between, uh, my center channel speaker between my left and right monitors and found that that worked really well. So if you're doing, you know, surround work, uh, having multiple monitors, there's some advantages to that as well. See some discussion of different tape recorders. Um, so just see, uh, I think experience. Dennis was listening, listing some uh, experience with uh, different tape recorders. Uh, 
So it says, uh, having learned most of my professional sounding audio recording experience was learned on 95% tape recorders like Nakamichi cassettes and two inch studers and analog gear, uh, high quality magnetic tape and no DAW experience. I remember thinking about getting Cubase because of the different magnetic tape emulations. So if you wanted to, you know, there are, you know, Steinberg was the first company that actually did a uh, analog kind of magnetic tape uh, plug-in called Magneto. So if you, and you could actually apply this to an input channel, but every single track, and we'll just show it to you here. Uh, so you could actually print through this. So let's say, and it's going to be found under distortion and you'll see Magneto too. So you can have physical modeling of analog tapes where you could adjust kind of the output the frequency, the high frequency adjustment, if you wanted to, the amount of saturation, if you wanted to be in dual mode, which is kind of going through the, uh, the process twice, like kind of playing back, uh, you know, through like, you know, maybe like, uh, two stages of the analog. So, but that's a, a, a wonderful plugin for that. So, I came up from, you know, two inch Studer and Atari machines as well. And, but I was always the guy that had to do all the tape calibration in the middle of a session. So I don't miss that part. All right. So we have a question uh is there a way to use the sampler track or some other way to create uh an instrument for my voice for example in other words is there a way of creating an instrument in cubase instead of contact of course and we could do it in the sampler track or uh directly inside of uh like even uh groove agent se would make a wonderful tool for that so let's say uh, if I just have like a voice part here. Then let's go to Vegas. All right, so let's say I go to my sampler control. Now all I have to do is drag this down um, and I could have my sampler track. And I could. Just have this hang on I have to turn something off in my office. All right, let's see if I get my MIDI controller back here. Give me a second. So as I just want to come here. So now I could just kind of play directly from there. And, you know, once I've done this, we could also just put it into uh, audio warp. Uh, and then once we activate uh, audio warp, we could say, okay, I just want to put it into music or solo mode. And I could now. And you could also put it into monophonic mode. So if you're saying something, you just want to change your pitch. And. I could now just come over here and in the middle of the phrase. So you could do stuff like that. But it also, if we had um, Groove Agent, so let's say if I just want to come here to Groove Agent SE, which is included, um, I could just drag and drop that sample. And at this point, uh, if I just go to pitch, I could say, okay, we want to set our pitch range from C1 to C2. And now like any notes that I play. So 
So yeah, you could definitely just kind of, you don't have to go to any third party tools for that. You could use the built-in sampler track or Groove Agent SE to play your voice from MIDI. All right, so we have Schrader Brothers saying hello. Thanks for joining the live stream. chat field jumped on me. Okay, so um, right, so we have a question. I saw an interesting workflow and wanted to share it with my colleagues. You open the, six, the second mix window and make its width to only show one track and then hide inspector, put mix window next to uh, the arrange window. Um, all right, so. All right, so take a look at this. So let me jump back to a different project. Right. So let's say if I'm here and I want Mix Console 2 to only show So now as I let's say if I have this over here and I move this window that whatever channel that I have selected. So I'm not sure if that automatically updates, but you could kind of see everything uh, for that one particular channel right there. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so I just see, um, how would I create an analog tape speed variation with pitch example, something like the way Strawberry Fields by the Beatles recorded, use that time stretch algorithm, unless you explained this earlier. So, yeah, so let's say we're like, I have all of my tracks here set to musical mode and my tempo is at 100 beats a minute. So the kind of the classic scenario that Tim is describing is Strawberry Fields Forever was actually two different takes and the, the, like the main part of the song, and I believe it's after kind of the drum fill and the ending part was a different take that was done at a different tempo and different key. So what they did uh, when they're working on the project is they slowed down the vocal, um, they slowed down the tape so that the pitch would change and then just kind of by luck, when the drum, after the drum fill came out and the little instrumental ending, it just kind of matched up perfectly pitch wise. So, you know, and so people would do very speed recording and, and playback, you know, pretty typically. So now what we could do is I could select all these different elements, put it into musical mode, and then we could place it into tape. So if while we're playing, as I adjust my tempo down, let's say to 90 beats a minute, this will simulate the, from 100 to 90, this would be like slowing down a tape machine 10%. So the tempo changes and the pitch changes accordingly. So if I go 80, we're slowing down the tempo and the pitch 20%. So this is how you could do kind of very speed recording uh, and kind of do that. So once again, make sure that all the tracks are selected, that you're in musical mode, and then you could switch the algorithm to tape. And then that would be all you have to do. So now when we change, you know, if it's not in tape, the speed will change, but the pitch will stay the same. 
but if you want it to mimic a very speed or you know then you could just put it into tape mode Uh, so we see will very audio work with chords in the future. So I could speculate that, you know, one day that it will go there. I don't think any technology is quite uh, nailed that yet. Um, but hopefully I would I would love to see it myself. But um, but I think technology still has a little ways to go. But I'm sure that some someone in our German team is staying up really late trying to figure it out. Okay, we have a question. Uh, under media in the right zone, there's a section called pattern banks, but I can't figure out what MIDI information is that's playing the pattern. Can you show what it's intended for? So I think that the patterns, um, so say we'll come over here to media and let me just pattern banks. Uh, uh, So these, I believe, are the pattern banks that, let's say if we have a MIDI track and we go to the MIDI inserts and we have our beat designer. So let's say if I wanted to come here uh, and just load up that these are the beat designer kits. So let's say I want it to Come over here and we'll load a preset that we'll see that these are, so what we see in these pattern banks are these are the presets from the Beat Designer MIDI plugin. So if you just wanted to drag, you know, these over to Beat Designer or let's see if we could load it. Um, so now, if I just want to take these, I could drag it over to the Beat Designer window. So if I leave this always on top, I could just come right there and drag and drop the patterns. All right, so we just see question. Hello, Greg. Uh, could you tell me if Cubase 11 would work well on the Mac M1V? So yes, uh, so it runs under Rosetta currently, but we have lots of people who are really happy with their performance, and we'll see that Cubase 12 uh, will be Mac M1 native. So. reading through different comments. And if you've learned a new tip or trick, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, we see Sable Winters is on the live stream. Thanks for joining. She's from the Bay Area in California. All right, so we have a question, how to easily make dual mono compression on stereo channel? So if you want it to, so let's say if I have a stereo track. All right, so let's say I just wanted to add two inserts. Okay, so when we come here, we can now go to the routing and then 
So once we see our inserts, we can go to routing here and we can say, okay, I want this to be mono. And I want this one to be mono. And then we could just at this point. So that way we could have this compressor on channel, on the left channel, this compressor in the right channel. So if you just go to the routing and then you could choose mono and go to the routing editor. You could pick uh, which channel is being used. Okay, so we just see question, uh, what video format can Nuendo 10 handle when I try to import AVI file does not want to take it. So we realize that, you know, video files are like really non-standard. So it could be the container type as well as the codec. Um, so the best resource is probably if you come over here and just say, um, if you just Google video support in Cubase, Nuendo, Wavelab, Dorico, uh, you'll just see this little help center article. So, you know, video files aren't like wave files that could be kind of loaded into anything. So you're gonna have container types. So you would need for an AVI file to be, uh, you know, for, the Kodak to be a DVD, DVC Pro, or Motion JPEG, Photo JPEG. So, you know, realize that just having an AVI file, there could be 100, you know, 200 different types of AVI files depending upon the Kodak. And so those are different things to be aware of. So you may have to get a video utility and just make sure it's doing one of these. Or if you do like a dot mov file or an mp4 you do like h263 h264 etc so you just you may need to convert the video file to that and there's plenty of free utilities that will allow you to do that Just reading through questions and comments. Thanks for all the great questions. All right, so we see Michael Pierce just wants people to give the like button some love. Okay, uh, so just says, uh, Greg, can you show some useful quantizing shortcuts and workflows, for example, without mouse interaction, quantizing 16th, uh, eighth grids, etc.? All right, so you know, just anything that you do want to quantize, you know, so say I just have, sorry, just wrong track. All right, you know, so you could set up different keyboard shortcuts you could define for the particular uh, quantized preset. Uh, and then you could come over here and you could find those at, um, so when you go to the key commands uh, and go to the quantized category, you know, here you could set you know, the, your quantized value to whole, half, you know, fourth. And you could also have for toggling, I have it kind of set up on a stream deck on my system, my studio, but you know, and you know, once you're here, you could just kind of choose to say, okay, I just wanted to, you know, what I generally will just kind of do more like spot quantization. So let's say if I just move stuff around randomly, turn off, my snap.
you know, but you know, like I will do, you know, like a lot of times, like I, I try not to do vocal correction unless something bothers my ear. I try not to do quantizing unless something feels weird, but you know, but that way you could just kind of come right over here and just, you know, quantize particular phrases. And you could also, uh, like we had set this up if you don't want to use a mouse, I think, let's see if we still have it set up. We had a question from the last live stream, let's say under generic remote. So I just have my a fader um, that will go through the different um, quantize presets. So if I just wanted to set up like my MIDI control here, I'll just say, I'll do this and we go to command quantize category, select next quantize that now I could just say, okay, I just want to quantize this all to like selected notes to whole notes. And then, okay, now I want 16th notes. And as you do this, I'm just moving the actual controller. Um, I could just kind of set different rhythmic values. And the cool thing is, like you may have noticed that when we come here to, um, you know, let's say back to whole note or half note that when I quantize, we could quantize the values, but now when I go to 16th notes that it's not quantizing the already quantized data that I could quantize the information based on 16th notes or 128th notes. So it's not kind of requantizing, uh, you know, it goes back to the original data and then quantizes that. And there's also lots of great stuff. So if you wanted to, you know, come over here, you could set, you know, the quantized strength for like kind of a software or iterative quantization. You could quantize lengths, you could quantize the ends of notes. And, you know, so just kind of set up the keyboard shortcuts and you can get very fast and powerful with it. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, where can we hear Beatles and Stone song that you played a lot of times in complete version, mixed and mastered? Um, so the reason that I use it as a song is it was uh, it hasn't been released, so there's no like weird YouTube copyright information, so it's not a released song, but. Uh, after hearing it on the live stream, you know, a couple of months ago, we had the, you know, a lot of people like the song quite a bit and it's composed. Uh, one of the, one of the songwriters is uh, Vince Melamed, who's long, you know, I've known him 20 some years and he's a wonderful songwriter and he's kind of a journeyman, like sideman keyboard player. He's played with, you know, the Eagles during kind of the, in the seventies and eighties. Uh, before they broke up, he's played with Bob Dylan, Jimmy Buffett, Roseanne Cash. Um, so just a wonderful writer. So he was a guest on one of our Zoom meetups a couple months back. And Sable loves that song as well. So Sable reached out to Vince and, and is doing a cover version of, and she's going to be releasing a version. So, uh, but, so I don't own the song. I just kind of use it. Um, but if you email me, I could, I, I could check with Vince if it's okay, if I just send a version that I kind of prepared to you, but I would want to get permission from Vince, but you could also check out, I think Vince did a solo record, but check out Vince Melamed, M-E-L-A-M-E-D, a uh, wonderful musician, songwriter and person. Okay, so I just see um, just a question. It says, uh, I'm on 11 Pro to now. Uh, I got a problem when I play my mix and go to 
my mix don't walk through i get i get and stop and then it goes on let me see if it continues on um so i'm not sure if you're able to maybe re-ask that question in a different way i'm not sure uh i'm not sure um what the question is with that so if you could let me know maybe ask the question in a different way uh, i'm sorry if i'm being dense All right, so we just see from Benny a uh, question. Sometimes when I work fast and do a lot at the same time, like Nuendo 10 crashes, say one of 30 times, uh, run PC with 10, uh, six cores and a lot of RAM, so the computer is strong. Um, so, you know, if you have a particular error message that you're doing, you know, you, you know, it seems like you indicated that you were on 10.2 earlier, but, you know, I think 10.3 is a free download from there, so make sure that you get uh, the latest version of Nuendo as well and see if that helps. All right, we see Michael Pierce is gonna start working on soup. So to, because it's winter and he doesn't want to have ice cream when it's cold outside. So maybe we get started on next week's Zoom meetup. We have virtual soup for Christmas. Okay, so we have uh, just a question. Uh, it may sound amateurish, but how can I export stems properly? Naming, color, each track's audio file starts at the beginning of a queue and end in a queue, et cetera, and open them in Pro Tools. All right, so the audio file itself isn't gonna contain a color, uh, so that's not gonna be transferred over. But all you have to do is come over here. You wanna set the left and right locators around the project. And if you wanted to, you could select um, just a single event and hit the letter like that is the entire length of the project and hit the letter P. So this will be the beginning and the end. Uh, I'll just do it since we had discussion on beetles and stones. I'll show that because this might be less stem like of an origin. So let, now, so I want to come over here. I'm going to just hit control or command A, select all, and then hit the letter P. So we've set our left and right locators around kind of the entire song. At this point, we go to file to export audio mix down. Uh, so we'll see channel selection. You wanna click on multiple. So here we could say, I want to export the stereo mix. I wanna export my group channels independently, my effects channels, my instrument tracks, and my VST and instruments and my audio channels. Now at this point, if I wanted to have these dry uh, with no effects, I could do that. If I wanted to uh, include the inserts channel strip, which includes the channel EQ, I could include that. I can include the send effects and embed those in and do my master if I wanted to incorporate any master effects processing. So you have a lot of flexibility here. We choose our different file format, probably a wave, uh, and you could just have it do whatever sample rate you need. There's different naming conventions. So if you wanted to put your name, the channel name, if you want to put free text in, uh, you could choose a destination. So if I wanted to have this go to even a mix down folder in the project and then just hit export audio and that will make your stems that could be loaded into any other DAW. So set, you know, select all the events, hit P to set the beginning and end point that, that sets the left and right locators and export audio mix down. And that would do everything, but the colors again, aren't going to transfer over. So, um, cause it, yeah, it's just exporting the wave files.
So we see uh, Sven is just saying, you know, uh, if we, you know, we could publish the project and then we could have a mixing competition. So there are some projects like you could download a project on the uh, Steinberg uh, download assistant for Cubase 11 already if you wanted to. But Okay, so we just see uh, just a question out of curiosity. I noticed that you welcome people to send you problematic projects. However, it's not an open cloud-centric email like Google. Do people not have size issues? So a lot of people will send like WeTransfer or Dropbox. You know, I get a lot of files via WeTransfer. And I think that's free for uh, two gigabytes or so. So that should suffice. Uh, but you could just share like a download link to any email address. All right, so we just see a question about free warp uh, track audio events are different from each other. Okay, so they're different files. Uh, inconsistent changes also affect track versions. They carry some alterations. Uh, tried to save as different file names, same problems. Um, so one thing, you know, if you're having, you know, this is going back to our question that we're looking at with warps, uh, with warping, like free warping, I think vocal tracks. So let me just, so if we were back onto, like when we're talking about these files here, you know, but if we've done a lot of warping, you know, one of the things that you could do is, you know, try to, you know, like after doing warping, you know, let's say if you did a new version, but just try to do a bounce selection and see if that helps at all. So if you just go to the bounce selection here and that should write a new file. But yeah, if you wanna send an email to the project, I'd be happy to check it out. All right, so we have Kevin Key Genius from from the UK checking in. Thanks for joining the live stream and being a part of the community. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how to create and save Groove Agent? Can you repeat that for me, please? Okay, so let's say if I, you know, had a drum loop here, and let's say I have an instance of Groove Agent. I assume this is a um, like creating a Groove Agent preset. Okay, so I will. All right, and I will just go ahead and slice this. All right, so now if you just right click, um, you know, you could just export the kit with samples and that should automatically carry it over. So just once you have, if you're looking to create your own Groove Agent, just right click here and export the kit with samples. We see Michael Teams is announcing, or John Costigan rather is announcing Michael Teams with the power vested in him as the new Postmaster General. So that's good.
All right, so we have Judy, who is glad to be here from Arizona. Thanks for joining the live stream, being a part of the community today. All right, so we see, uh, hi, Greg, thanks for your videos. Can I, question, uh, can I see my UR44C in the inspector tab and use the control room at the same time? So I have kind of the same problems with uh, an AXR4 that I use in my studio. And what I do is I just take my audio connections and outputs. So I think the UR44C, you have four outputs. So maybe set your stereo output to just another output like this, and then have your control room set to uh, your outputs that you want. And then, uh, you know, that's kind of a workaround. I know it's not good. We we're trying to get the Yamaha team to change that so that you could have it. But if I now add an audio track, uh, let me just check to make sure I have a connection on an input. So let's say, I, I add a bus and I want this to be a mono. And we'll say this is coming from your 44C input one. We'll go to add a track. We'll make it a mono. So, you know, try setting it. I know it's I know it's awkward and kind of a pain to do, so All right, so we're seeing feature requests for polyphonic very audio. So yep, I'll pass that along again. Okay, so we just see a uh, question. Uh, when you detect silence and process, is there any setting that glues the events so there wouldn't be any empty space in between? So let's say, I'll just kind of create a scenario here. Okay, so let's say at this point I had rendered, oh, let's say we have this and I'll just replace. So I want to do a detect silence on this. Okay, so we'll just choose our threshold. All right, so we'll compute. All right, so now if I process, all right, so now if I come over here and let's, I think if I glue these together, now this turns it into a part, but this part can contain multiple events. So even though I've done the detect silence, so uh, I'm not sure, you know, most people do the detect silence to get rid of it, but if you want it to, you know, just come there and treat it as a single entity, then you could try to glue the parts together and then it would turn those separate, you know, unsilenced sections into parts that you could move one thing at a time. Okay, so we see uh, why standard composers may want to buy Nuendo. Is it an overkill? So, you know, a couple of features. So if you're starting to think of compositions with Dolby Atmos, that makes it a big plus. Also, sometimes composers tend to have a lot of picture edits that come in. So Nuendo does offer reconforming 
Um, so like if you've composed, you know, your entire piece and then the, you know, the editor comes back or director says, you know, we cut out 3.29 seconds, uh, out of this scene. So, you know, make everything fit that you could, you know, do re reconforming, you know, so there, there's a, you know, some, some things that Nuendo makes sense for composers as well. There's, you know, a lot of those have been kind of migrated into Cubase over time. But, you know, but if you are composing and thinking in Dolby Atmos, you know, that makes a lot of sense. All right, we see from Tim Weinheimer that there's pouring down in Southern California. So, yeah, we're talking to colleagues that are all kind of staying inside today due to weather. All right, you see Daniel's just uh, loving the new lo-fi uh, piano howling in instrument, so it's great. It's nice for Nisa Steinberg to offer it free as an early Christmas gift for everyone. See, Michael Teams just mentioning his helicopters flying over a studio. I guess we, we have some secret military helicopter thing in our that flies over our neighborhood here. All right. All right. So we just see a question. Uh, so, how long till M1 native? So, Steinberg has announced that Cubase 12 will be M1 uh, native. So, when that's released, uh, they're just saying early 22. So, but make sure that you pressure all of your plugin companies to be M1 native as well. So, all right. So, we see Zozilla the Great just apologizing for being late. Don't have to worry about apologizing. Just show up. And if you're late, you have to hit the like button. So, that's the only punishment. Okay, let's see if my chat has jumped. Sorry, let me just, my chat jumped on me without me noticing, so. Okay, let me see if I'm approaching getting caught up. Let me just check times. Okay, just make sure I didn't miss a whole series of questions. Okay, so we see a question from Judy. I record MIDI tracks from my Montage 8 and I want to add a vocal through UR22 interface. Uh, how should the audio inputs, outputs be set 
for having MIDI and audio through the interface. Um, so, you know, if you have, like, I have a very similar interface here. So let's say I will come over to, let's say I go to my audio connection. So let's say if I just have a two in, two out interface. So, you know, if you are, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if you have the UR22 only has two inputs. Um, so if you are using the inputs, you know, so, and it also has a, you know, a, a, you, you may have USB communications on your, uh, on your Montage 8 being set to transmit MIDI information, but that doesn't necessarily carry the audio, even though it, there could be a mode in the Montage where it transmits as an audio interface. So you may have, so I'm not sure if you, you know, when we're working with Cubase, we could basically have one USB audio interface at a time as defined here um, in your audio system. So you may see like your Steinberg UR22. You may also see like the Yamaha Montage. So, you know, when we have MIDI information being sent to the Montage, you know, and we could have it transmit audio, but it's not going to have like a microphone preamp. Uh, and that's why you have the UR22. So I'm not sure if you have a mixer. So many people will take the audio outputs of keyboards into a mixer and the mixer can then also monitor the signals out of the audio interface. So some people will take, treat their audio interface as a mixer. So you could take, you know, the MIDI going over USB to your montage and then the audio outputs of the montage we could connect uh, as sometimes as an external instrument if you have Cubase Pro and we could do that but that's going to eat that's going to use both of your inputs on the UR22 so if you uh, are continuously monitoring the UR22 you know so many people if you know what a lot of people will do is to record the audio play the MIDI from the montage and record it as an audio file directly into Cubase, so you have that. Then once that's been recorded as audio, you could connect a microphone and we could go to your audio connections. And at this point we'll say, okay, let's just go to our inputs and we'll say, okay, I want it to have this go into input one of my audio interface add an audio track here, go to the audio. We say, okay, we want this going into, you know, this particular input. And as we add our track, we could record the signal from the microphone. So some people will use kind of their audio interface as a mixer for their external keyboards. Um, but, you know, once you, but if you need to use that connection for a microphone, try just to, you know, unplug, the keyboard after recording the audio. So play the sequence, the MIDI is sent out to the montage, the audio out of the montage is connected to the audio inputs of the UR22. Once that's been recorded, that connection can be disconnected and then connect your microphone and sing over top. All right, so we see, uh, Feature request for multi-track free warping. So we see lots of people have had that. We'll pass it along again. Uh, wonderful to see Mandy Lane on the live stream. Thanks for joining. All right, so we just see, how do I slice loops in Cubase? I got some old Akai CDs. Um, so, you know, anytime that, you, you know, we have loops, so let's say if I just wanted to take, uh, a drum loop here, I'll just go to a different project. So if you have the sampler track, so let's say I come right over here and I have an empty sampler track, I could take a, my loops and drag it right in and then I could just slice. So once I've created slices, each key 
is now just been sliced up directly that way. Uh, at this point, we see this little MIDI icon. I could drag this directly to my timeline. And then each of these notes represents the slice with the rhythmic position. Now we could also do slices inside of Groove Agent as well. So if I wanted to come here, I could take a drum loop from your Kai CDs, drag it to a pad, click on the slice options and click on create slices. Now each of these slices will automatically be assigned to a particular pad. And if we go to the patterns, it will create a pattern that is going to be, and this pattern is in essence just triggering these slices in the same order. And at this point you could manipulate slices. So you could do that a couple of different ways. Also, if you just wanted to kind of slice within the sample editor, you could come over here uh, go to the hit points and we will just say, okay, we're going to create your slices based on hit points. And I could just say, okay, now that we've created slices at this point, we, I could double click. And if I wanted to quantize to, you know, eighth notes or quarter notes, I could just select the events and quantize those as well. So a couple of different options there, Mandy. Um, so, all right, great to see Marcos on the live stream. Uh, it says, Greg, any version, any of WaveLab is for mastering than any DAW Cubase? So, you know, I would say that, you know, WaveLab is going to be a purpose built solution for mastering, you know, whereas DAWs, you know, some people would do processing, but if you want to do a lot of mastering, WaveLab is probably a better tool. You know, it's just kind of a, a, a tool set that's really designed for mastering. So, all right. So we have Jean Marie Horvat on the live stream. Wonderful to see you, Jean Marie. Thanks for joining. You, he could be our celebrity audio engineer attendee for today, one of them. Okay, we have a question. Uh, is there a quicker way to get the graphic pics of VST plugins without one by one loading them into a project and then clicking on the photo button? Uh, so with plugins, that's gonna be the fastest way. So uh, if you're not familiar with this, let's say, if I go to uh, add a particular audio track here, uh, let's say I'll just quickly add an instrument track you know, and it's always helpful if, uh, let me just, sorry, add an audio track here. You know, if, you know, manufacturers have the abilities to generate these as well, but let's say if I'm in this particular plugin, you know, there, if we want to see like the pretty iconic, like icons that when we come over here to VST effects and we go to, you know, where we see these pretty pictures, you have to kind of come over here and just kind of click on the actual camera icon. So, you know, as I do it, I just kind of, you know, like as I add plugins, I just do it once, you know, it takes, you know, a, a matter of seconds to really do so, but there, there isn't like a batch way of doing it and you can update kind of the status view of the particular uh, instruments as well. So if you don't like the default one, you could override those as well. So, but there really isn't a, a quicker way than doing it one by one. Sorry about that. A 
Okay, so we just see from a question from Dan Freeman. I need to record a political public meeting on Cubase, not copywritten. Does uh, Cubase do that, or do you have any recommendations? So yeah, you could definitely record any audio into Cubase, so no problems doing that. You know, so while we think of it as like a music production system, you know, there's people that go out and you know make sounds for cars and record you know all sorts of different you know forensic audio you know investigational audio capturing podcasts you know cubase is used for all that so it's a it's a great tool for that All right, so we're seeing fun horror stories of bad plane landings I'm reading about, so I could share plenty from thousands of flights I've done, so, all right. All right, so we have uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the house from Barry Williams. Thanks for joining our live stream. All right, and we have Nick on. Okay, so we just see, uh, and just going back to our, our question previously, it's a, does the MIDI need to run through the interface to work together? I've tried to hook up the mic and set a track, but it doesn't sound. Um, so, you know, the MIDI can run into the, uh, can run from the montage into the, you know, into the MIDI in of the UR22 interface. But, but, but both of them could also work just over USB connection. So probably by default, the montage would transmit the MIDI information over USB. Um, and when you're, if you're not hearing anything with the microphone, Judy, make sure that when you go to the audio connections that you go to the inputs and that you know this input is defined. So if you're connecting like a microphone, we could say, okay, I want to add a bus and we could choose to add a mono bus, make sure that we have, we tell what physical connection on a UR22 input one or two is being utilized. And then when we go to add an audio track, make sure that we have the correct input set here. So if it's, it may default to stereo in, uh, and if you're just connected to, you know, if you haven't set that, uh, if you haven't defined the inputs and create a mono input, you could use either the mono input if it's been defined or just the left input if you're an input one or the right input if you're an input two. Now to hear it, you wanna make sure that, um, you have monitor enable, then you should see signal as you talk and as you increase the gain. Now, if it is a condenser microphone, there's a switch, I think it's on the back on the UR22, depending which UR22 you have, that may say 48V and that's phantom power. So if you have a condenser microphone, you may need to flip that switch so that the phantom power is turned on. So, uh, and as you bring the gain up, the volume on the front panel, you could adjust, you, you, once this is in, you should start seeing the meters show up here and then you could arm the track for record. All right, so we just see a um, comment from uh, Can Emery Can. Uh, the fader set to quantize setting is why I use Cubase for my DAW choice. I mean, look what Cubase can do that other software developers can't even imagine. I'm a fan of Cubase. That's great. I think that was uh, Jay's question from Friday.
Okay, so we have a question uh, about ghost notes when selecting two. How do I lock the view so I can add notes for B, which is already on A, every time I double click to add a note, B switches to A. Um, Okay, so I don't understand a question. Let me just try to reread it again. So I'm not sure if you're in the MIDI editor or drum editor. Or if it's an audio event. or the sampler tracks, so and maybe uh, Best Korean Jesus, if you could just uh, give us some more information. I'm sorry, I don't know where to kind of start with that. Sorry for a misunderstanding on my part. All right, so we see um, from uh, Matt Elder says, will the Zoom invite be linked in the Discord? So I will try to have the Zoom invite. I'll, I'll post it in Friday's live stream for Tuesday. So I don't think we'll try to have a special guest. We'll just kind of have a little holiday celebration for a week from today. So, but I'll, I'll create the link and get it posted on Friday. And then if it, you know, if people want to share it in the Discord, that'd be fine. Uh, I just see Mark Rabin just asking, uh, is there a Zoom today? So we'll, we'll do the Zoom next Tuesday and I'll take the, um, and that'll be the last live stream we do for the year with the holidays. Probably people have something better to do on New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve. All right, so we have Graham Witcher from Royal Wuton Bassett. Um, thanks for joining. All right, uh, so we have a question from uh, Kerwin Young. Um, says, in Cubase slash Nuendo, how can we customize the score editor to export the track names with each export for new projects or must this be done manually for each project? Okay, so let's take a look. I will. So let's say we have a look at our score editor here. Okay, so it's how can we customize the score editor to export the track names with each export for new projects? Um, Okay, so let's see if I, okay, so here is the, to export the track name. So when we look at this, we'll see we opened up, I'll just call this track Kerwin. Okay, and I will, hold on, shift key, and that's what the event will be named. We'll go to our score editor, so it's now, it's gonna be called Kerwin. 
All right, so I will Sorry, I spelled it wrong. Let me just. Okay, so export tracks with, with each export for new projects or. All right, so let's say if I do, let's see, and if I'm misunderstanding this, Kerwin, just let me know. Um, when I go to, I'll say import tracks from project. Just okay, and I'm just going to import this track and we'll see if the score names carry over. So it looks like that carried over there. So if this is the like the track name that you're talking about in the score editor, let me know, Kerwin. I'm afraid I may be misunderstanding, but if you could just let me know. All right, so we have a question. How can I route my external instrument, a Yamaha PSR? Um, PSR dash SX900 as an instrument track. So all you have to do, and you can do this in Cubase Pro, uh, but if you go to your audio connections, you'll see an external instruments tab. Uh, so at this point, we want to add an external instrument so I'll just call this PSR SX900. Okay, and once we have this set up, we need to tell it what, you know, and we need to take the audio outputs of that particular instrument and connect it directly into the, uh, to inputs of our audio interface. So this is when it's helpful to have an interface that has more inputs uh, other than like, you know, just a two in, two out. So once we defined where that input is connected, I can now come over here. Let's add an instrument track. I will look under external and then we could say, I just wanted to add my PSR and then I could just play my external instrument and the run it through all of the effects, EQs that I would on a normal, um, you know, directly on a normal track. So, you know, at that point, it's basically taking the audio outs of the instrument and feeding it directly to inputs of the audio interface.
All right, my chat field jumped at me again. Sorry about that. Okay, so we just see um, how to use WaveLab SE uh, in Cubase. I don't see it in the editor's choices. So I'm not sure if SE may not connect. Um, so let's say when I come over here, we could just say, you know, if I have an audio event, so, it, you know, the SE is a very limited version of that. Uh, I don't even think I have. SE installed uh, on any of my systems, but let me just. You know, so it, when you come here to audio, you can see, you know, edit and wave lab and that will launch wave lab pro. Um, and then I could do editing and kind of go back and forth. But the, the SE version may not have the two-way communication. It may be more just kind of like a standalone editor. But if you want to email me at uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de, uh, I'd be happy to kind of check it out just to find out to make sure. But I don't have a copy installed on this system. Thanks, Jazz Dude, for letting me know that the chat jumped without me realizing. All right, so we just see, uh, will Cubase going to support Windows 11 UI with modern context menus, et cetera? So, you know, there's a lot of things that might be more kind of operating system specific that don't necessarily, uh, you know, tie into uh, like user interface designs of Steinberg and realize that we have to kind of keep user interface elements kind of as platform independent as possible so that they work across Mac and PC. So I haven't heard of much plans for, uh, you know, for modern context menus uh, or many people wanting that, but I'll pass it along. All right, uh, so we have a question. Uh, hi, Greg, can you show us uh, how to use the vocal harmony function? All right. So let me just jump back to a different project. So when we have this, and this works best in conjunction with uh, the chord track. So let's say if I have this going on. So I'm going to just kind of figure out the chords from the piano event here. So once I do this, I'm going to go to uh, my project menu and I'm gonna to go to chord track and I'm gonna say create chord symbols. This will now populate a, and create a chord track if you don't have a chord track. And so that we could see this. So now if I want it to just take a little section, we'll just listen. So let's say I want to take that uh, phrase where she said leading a lot, leaving a lie or whatever the exact lyric was. 
So I want to take just that little section. So now that we know kind of what the chords are, um, I will come over here to my audio menu and go to generate harmony voices. And you can say, okay, I'll just. And now that we've done that, now the, the harmonies that we just created or will be correct based on a chord. So once you create the chord track, select it, and then you could automatically create uh, up to four harmonies at once. All right, so I just see a question in this probably going back to WaveLab SC says a question, uh, is WaveLab a separate program? So yes, WaveLab is a separate program than Cubase. The two do have some uh, links between them. Um, I just see also some confusion on if the UR interface has MIDI and uh, and or just USB. So it's it, the, UR, the UR22 does have MIDI in and out. So the UR22, 44, uh, 824, they all have MIDI capabilities. To see a question uh does this apply to cubase elements 11 as well just got on so sorry that i'm so far behind i'm not sure what that was so it's kind of out of context so but if you want to uh just remind me and give me some context drew of uh if what feature was in cubase elements 11 sorry it might have been something i did 20 minutes ago 30 minutes ago but you see that jazz dude has uh posted a comparison chart Uh, all right, so I see, hi Greg, uh, any update on the fix for the Cubase IC Pro app for the iPhone? Still not working on the latest, uh, last iOS 15.2 update, IC Pro still crashing. Uh, so I haven't heard of anything, but I didn't know that it was crashing with 15.2. Um, but I could, if you want to send me an email, I could follow up and see and I could try it. Uh, I don't think I had the latest iOS version on my iPad. All right, uh, so we see a question. Is there a way to put my monitors in uh, high graphics mode or in higher display mode? So it's really kind of at the operating system level. But if you're running Windows, you go to preferences, you know, because in Windows, if you go to preferences into general, you could enable, there'll be like a little button here. We don't see it on Mac OS, but there's a button that says enable high DPI. So you could turn that on, and if you have a high DPI monitor and display card, um, that you could turn on high DPI, and there's different high DPI scaling. So uh, if you have that all set up for your system, then you should be good to go. All right, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like buttons. All right, uh, so we see a question. Um, hi, Greg, in old versions, it was possible to click the top ruler and the locators both left and right together would jump to the clicked location. Uh, is it possible to do in new versions? I don't remember that functionality, but I know that if you hold down like command or control or alt or option that you could just click. Um, but, and I know that you could drag this, but I don't remember it kind of moving based on clicking, but you know, if you wanted to set the left or right locators, so on my Mac keyboard, it's just gonna be um, like, you know, option and control. 
So I think it's alt uh, or option and command. I think it's alt control uh, on Windows. So let me know if that helps. Okay, so it says, I would like to record two octaves of my voice and turn that into an instrument, uh, not have uh, not have Cubase create all the pitches based off one tone. Is this, can this be done in the sampler? Yeah, so any, you know, if you have like a, let me just see if I come over here, see if I can find like maybe like an ooh or something like that. All right, so let's say, you know, if someone just recorded something like this. All right, and I just wanted to use one, one phrase of it. I could just kind of choose my start and end point. And then, you, you know, you could do different loops, uh, but yeah, you could definitely do that. So if we activate audio warp, you know, so all sorts of stuff that you could do. So let's say if I just want to put this into. And you could obviously kind of set the loop points better than I did, but yeah, so just you could take one one song word and drop in a sampler track and play it. Okay, so I see maybe a clarification. It says that when I have two of the MIDI sections selected, um, okay, so let's see if I could recreate this from Okay, so Okay, so it says when I have two of the MIDI sections selected, I could draw notes on B where there are no overlaps of A. I want to be able to draw a 16th note on a bar of A without it changing views. So I'm not sure if this is parts are stacked. So let me just see. Okay, so let's say if I come here.
Okay, so I'm not sure uh, for best screen Jesus if these are stacked. Um, so let's say two, or if it's within one part. So it says uh, when I have two MIDI sections selected, I can draw notes on B where there are no overlaps of A. I want to be able to draw a 16th note on bar of A without it changing views. So, so let's say if I'm here, so I'm not sure if you wanted to do just something like that to draw that note without changing views, but you could probably also, so, but I'm not sure if the parts are stacked or if you have multiple tracks so if you have multiple tracks you know you could obviously all right and i will say duplicate this particular track Okay, so if I'm here, we could just All right, let me just change the name conventions here. All right, so say I have these two selected, I'm in the editor. And I want to And let me just change one of these, so it's... All right, so say if I'm here, um, so I wanna be able to draw a 16th note on a bar of A without it changing view. So if we have both of these selected, so I think it's going to, um, and I'll just change the color of this maybe to illustrate this slightly differently. So let's say we'll have green, we'll make it very Christmassy. Um, and I'll change my color scheme. So let me just... So we'll say to part, all right, so we'll have kind of red and blue, you know, so if, if I wanted to draw a 16th note, let's say I'm in like the green is the active part or the red is the active part. I could now just draw notes in here, but still see both parts together. So as soon as I make this the active partners keyboard shortcuts for this, um, so let me know if that's what you're doing. If it's parts that are like multiply selected or if they're on top or stacked on top of each other. Sorry if I'm not getting it. All right, so just see, like when I, in further clarification, when I double click even on, uh, even if I have B selected, it will pull up MPE or delete the note A. So if it's, you know, once I'm here, you know, as soon as, you know, so there is a preference where if you double click, so, you know, if I want it to switch the active part, you could just click if they're both visible, you could just kind of click on one of the parts and that will switch the active part from the inactive part. And you can see the other one gets kind of diminished uh, in colors. So, but let me know if I'm kind of going down the right path for you. Sorry about that. All right. 
see a nice comment from Mark Raven. Just um, see if I could find it back. Sorry about my chat field just jumping a lot today. So just saying uh, thanks for my patience and intuition answering our endless questions. Of course, I had to come after one that I probably didn't understand, but sorry about that. But let me know if I'm kind of going the wrong way. Okay, so I just see uh, from Kerwin Young just saying, thanks, Greg. My issue is with the names not showing up in Dorco, but I've been able to solve the problem. Thanks. So I think if you just kind of drag and drop, it may not carry the name over, but it would carry the, the MIDI data, like the MIDI information within the part, but probably not the name. Let's see, Pablo has broken the cardinal rule and mentioned coffee in the middle of a live stream when I have like an hour to go, so uncool. Anyway, I just want a coffee now, but if I had a coffee, then I would have to take lots of bathroom breaks, so. Okay, uh, so I just see, um, I'm new to this. Does Cubase have beat mapping like in Acid? So I'm not sure what beat mapping in Acid is. Um, so, um, but you know, you could take any audio, for, you know, I mean, Acid was obviously known for being able to take, you know, different loops and you know and so once we're here we could say okay i have this particular loop and my tempo is at 120 beats a minute that we could place it into musical mode and as we play i could just come here and have it automatically follow the beat. So I'm gonna go to 144. So you know any of the audio can be placed into musical mode once it knows once Cubase knows what the tempo is, which most loops would do. But if I'm misunderstanding, just let me know. But I haven't seen Acid in a decade or two. Okay, so we have a question. How can uh, take a synth bass and multiband route it to low, mid, and high bands where I can, uh, example, have distortion and chorus on the mid band and reverb on the high band channel? Okay, so let's say I want to take a synth bass part. Let me just... Okay, let's come over here. Let's do a quick retro log. So let's say we're gonna have this. Um, all right, so if I wanted to have distortion on one, you know, one of, the, one of the things you could do is let's say, as I wanted to come here. So, you know, you could do, people will do different kind of uh, multi-band chains if you wanted to kind of be able to split notes but you know one of the great things is you could also just say okay if i wanted like mid-range like distortion in the mid-range for this bass uh i will come over here just to my audio inserts and one of the great plugins is you could just go to quadrifuzz 2 so now i could say okay i just want it 
to have, you know, at this point, let's say I just want only distortion in these particular frequency ranges. So I can say, okay, let's just. So now I'm only having distortion in in this frequency range and I could adjust, you know, the frequency range if you wanted to. So um so if I wanted to do that and you know, right after so you, if I want to do this via send, if you want to do this all at once, um, I could just say, okay, I wanted to take this. Let's add a, a send effect. So I will add an effects channel track to this and let's make it a distortion. So we'll come over here to Magneto or not Magneto, but Quadrafuzz. So I come over here, I'll just get rid of that. So I just want um, distortion only on these particular frequencies. So, and when I come here to the quadrifuzz, I could just say, let's come over to, um, where my quadrifuzz is as an insert. And now I just wanted uh, chorusing on that particular frequency. So now if I put the coursing after, I could now. So the coursing is only in the mid range frequency. So, you know, you could do stuff like that. And another method, if you wanted to just have reverb on the highs is just to come over here. I could add a track and we could say, okay, I'm gonna add an, another effects channel to the selected channels. And I wanted to add, um, let's say a reverb. So let's add a revelation. So now when we play, but I could go to the revelation reverb. I'm going to move this down a slot and just put in a, I think we could even go to like the panner or the spatial. Um, so I'm going to come over here and just get to the imager plugin. And I only want uh, band like my high frequencies to split. So now I could have the reverb only on the high frequencies. And that's all that we will hear is just gonna be that particular reverb on the high frequency. So we could kind of split frequency ranges of instruments and effect sends in a couple different ways, but you know, check out like the multiband distortion here and you know, using something like the imager plugin and then you could just kind of solo you know just if you wanted to just have the reverb only on the high frequencies you could just kind of solo that and kind of split the frequency range before it hits the reverb See, Mark Rabin is saying he got his vaccination booster and he swears he plays better now. So that's great. Better musicianship through science. All right, so I just see a question from Don M. It says, uh, does anyone know what interface would work with Cubasis on Android tab A7? I've done an exhaustive search and nothing, even with Steinberg. Um, 
So I I don't have uh, an Android Tab 7, but maybe someone else was. I know on Chromebooks, I think the UR12 works um, on Chromebooks, but I'm not sure with, with the Galaxy Tab A7 if it works. All right, so we have Peter checking in from Montreal. All right, if you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. Just read through comments here. All right. Uh, hi, Greg. How would you insert an audio plugin on stereo out, but only for monitoring? Example, automatically disabling when exporting to an audio file. Could this be done with a control room maybe? So yeah, definitely in a control room because a control room is just a monitoring pass. So a lot of people use this for like maybe something like sonar works, which is kind of like a uh, room correction reverb. So if you go to the control room, what you want to do is uh, click on the main tab and then just go to inserts and then you could have up to eight inserts here. Then when you go to export the audio, this path isn't actually uh, in the path of the audio mix sound, it's just a monitoring path. So just run it as an insert. Uh, so again, uh, go to the main tab, you wanna click on the main tab here and then click on inserts and then you could have a plugin that will be processed for monitoring that you don't have to you know, remember to turn off every time so that it's not included with the audio mix down like a room correction. So, All right, we see Randy Lee's viewing from his phone, just got back from his foot doctor. Thanks for joining. All right, uh, so we just see a question. Um, Hi, Greg, how can I integrate my MIDI hardware patch lists and banks like for my Oberheim Matrix 1000 so I can add it as a MIDI instrument track and browse through my patches and sound banks and menus? All right, so yeah, that was always an interest. That's the one that just had like numbers for the presets, but it had presets in it. Um, so a lot of times what you may need to do is if we come over here, let's see if there, there might even be, and this is, there could be patch maps floating around, but if we go to uh, more options and let's go to your MIDI device manager, so we could install a device. And there's a good chance that you might be able to find like a Cubase patch script floating around. And that's kind of of the era. Where you... All right, so if you actually see, um, let me just Google real quick and see. So you don't have to create this. All right. Um, all 
All right, so here's the actual editor that you could install. Um, and let me see. just so here's the device panel that you could install um, all right so but if you could find the patch script so that that's the panel is a good one to have but what you would do is just kind of come over here and say, okay, I want it. Um, you know, if you have, let's say like a Proteus 2, still have one. Um, and at this point we could say, okay, this is gonna be connected. We could say open device, and then you'll see patch banks. So here you could actually see um, all of the different patch scripts and you could actually just double click and type and you could set the you know the program change messages all directly from here so once that is set up and you could copy this into the scripts folder under preferences if you find the one but um so if i add a midi track at this point i will come over here and say, okay, I want this going out to my Proteus 2. We would choose a connection and I could now see all my patch scripts just kind of like that. So that's how you can see your patch name. So I'm not sure, you know, I always remember the matrix 1000 as just being kind of, you know, three numbers and you went through like the 1000 patches that way. But if there was actually patch names for it, I don't remember if there was. through okay so i see best screen jesus will send a video to the a and b midi question All right, so we just see a uh, question. Hello, Greg, is it possible to lower project pitch for VSTi in Cubase? I have folk recording with the pitch lowered approximately minus 20, 30 cents and would like to add some VSTi instruments. Thank you. So, you know, MIDI itself isn't going to ne necessarily, uh, you know, follow any pitch changes that you do in audio, but a lot of instruments can be detuned. Um, so let's say if I just want it to come uh, let's look, see if we can see it in retro log. So if I come here to retro log, we could adjust like the pitch here. So let's say if I wanted this to be 420, um, so you could do tuning there within the particular instruments. If I had Howling in Sonic SE, um, all right. So let's say if I'm here and I have Howling in Sonic SE, you could also adjust tuning here. So it's really more of a matter of the instrument if it supports it. So if I say, okay, I want this to be, you know, 410, you know, it looks like it could go down, it could go down to uh, like 35 or 25 cents up and down. So, so just try adjusting that. Um, but you could always record the MIDI uh, and then have that MIDI recording 
has audio and pitch shifted down if the instruments you want to use don't support that. Okay, so we just see, uh, hello, Greg, a lot of my question, uh, a lot of my studio clients, excuse me, turn my phone off, um, are asking when I bounce down the master projects to give them a OMF file as opposed to a regular multiple stems file. Is that better to do? And generally not. There's no real advantage of an OMF file. You know, the old days it was, you know, maybe the person is importing it directly into like a video program that's hard to just load in stems. Uh, but usually most audio programs, you know, OMF could lack some functionality, you know, like I think even dual like stereo files or split to mono. So it's kind of an older standard, you know, it's maybe 20 years. It was pretty common to, to migrate information between different DAWs. Uh, AAF is kind of an updated version of that. But most people I know will just simply, you know, exchange different stem files. Um, and that's more common, but you could do it. There's no real benefits of OMF unless the person is maybe doing a, a video where they, they can't really uh, handle multi-track audio well. Okay, so just see, uh, so they still kind of have this available here, but uh, from about the A and B part from Best Screen Jesus, it says, uh, perhaps draw a 16th note on one of those green bars. Let's see if we can do this quickly. Okay, so let's say if I want to draw a green note here, uh, let's say. I'll just put a 16th note. Okay, so now if I wanted to click on green or red, um, so it says I'd like to uh, lock it so that I could draw counter melodies and arpeggios on the longer notes. You know, so if, you know, so depending which one, but if you have a video that could, uh, I could recreate kind of the similar scenario that you have, but you know, you could see that pretty clearly, but I guess if you have this part selected, you may not see the, the red underneath, but you know, just kind of clicking on that particular pad or there's a keyboard shortcut for go to next part to indicate that. And another way to do this also might be uh, this kind of vintage MIDI stuff, but you know, looking at it in the list editor as well, you kind of get a graphic representation here and then you could see all of the events, uh, whether, you know, so, this way you could, you know, perhaps draw different elements in as well, if that makes sense. But if you send a, send me a link to like a video file, that'd be great. All right, uh, so we see a question from Mitch. Uh, Greg, I've recorded a MIDI part. Some notes are extremely close to each other, uh, say a flam type uh, instance. Um, sometimes when I select uh, the MIDI event, I want to change velocity on and then try to lower or raise the velocity on the lower half of the screen. Every time I draw the change, um, in velocity, it selects the note I don't want to that's next to it. 
uh, what am I doing wrong? All right, so let's just create a scenario here. I'll just do maybe like a quick 30 second note. I'll just do this in a quick drum editor. Okay, so let's say, and now I'm going to switch this to, I'll just switch it to 64ths here. For this particular note, okay. Okay, so uh, it says every time I draw a change in the velocity, it selects the note I don't want to that's next to it. All right, so let's say I want to take this note. Um, all right, so there kind of I went to the next note. But one other way that you might help is if you just select the velocity here. And then you could increase. Uh, and let's say if these notes are really close. You know, so let's say if I come here um, and you hold down control or command plus shift, you could just go over the selected note just like that, so that may be more accurate than having to kind of draw in if you move the mouse inadvertently, but also, you know, just if you select this note here, you could just adjust velocity from the info line. So maybe some try some of those and see if that helps. All right, so we just see, uh, is there a way to have a global question? Um, uh, sorry about that, just had an email pop in. So, uh, so question, is there a way to have a global key command to move objects left or right, no matter if it's an event or a MIDI note? Um, all right, so let's say we'll come here. I wanted to move this event, so I think it's, so I'm just using uh, control plus left and right arrows for, for the events on the project window. When we double click here, so just it's uh, control or command plus left or right arrows and that will move it based on the snap value. Uh, here on a grid value. So if I move select quarter notes, I can now move it quarter notes. And if I'm on the main project window, you know, if I have this set to uh, quarter notes here, so let's say I have grid and let's say if I want this on bars, I can move it by bars or use the quantize value. So it's the same key command. So control or command plus the left and right arrows and that can move events on the timeline.
All right, uh, so we see how can I limit the insert slots? So on the inspector, we're gonna see kind of the full range of audio inserts. If we're in uh, like the large full size mixer, uh, we can see all of the inserts here and um, Just find a quick setting here. Okay, so now if we come over here, so if I say uh, this little drop down menu just to the right of racks, we could say fixed number of slots. So I could see all 16 inserts. But if I only want to see one more than the inserts, uh, number of inserts that I have in the project, I could uncheck that in the main mix console to. Uh, but I don't think that carries over into the lower zone mixer or the inspector, but you could do it on the, uh, on the large full screen mixer. Okay, reading, uh, right, reading more questions and comments. Thanks for all the great questions. And once again, if you learn something new, make sure that you do hit the like button. That enables us to continue to do these live streams. Just read through more questions and comments. So. All right, uh, so I just see, can I turn Cubase into a loop station? So what I know some people will do for kind of create a looper type of function, you know, is just kind of come over here uh, and they'll, you know, maybe start a quick So let's say we have a number of audio tracks and there's really no limit. So I know people that will, and people do this kind of like a looper functionality, like, you know, they normally have. So let's say you're recording. So let's say, okay, we're play, record. And then once you're happy, you could just like go to the, I'll put it into cycle that would help. So let's say, I, okay, so I'm, have that part looped and I want to punch in on this part and then you could just move down and the other tracks are playing and as you do this you could just hit a foot switch at the end of the loop and say oh okay maybe I didn't like this take you know I'm not feeling that one it'll just kind of automatically keep going I like that performance let's get to the next track Okay, and then you can say, okay, what I just played was terrible. You can have another switch that just mutes it. Let's go to the next track. Okay, and then you can just continue to. So I've seen lots of people kind of do live looping type of workflows just like that. So. Okay, reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. All 
All right. Uh, so it just says, I have a question the other day. I had a client that came in and wanted to import MP4 files, but couldn't get it to do it. Uh, and and have to actually play it in real time. Is there a way to import MP4 files? So, you know, there's, um, you know, there's MP3 files and, you know, which are audio MP4 files can contain audio or video. So, um, but a lot of these are, I'm assuming that this is probably straight off of a phone. Um, so there isn't a way to do that. So you're probably better off sonically just actually, you know, recording a line output. Um, so, but it, it depends, you know, it's kind of now just a, a container type that's often just like someone saying into their phone and they want that to automatically be carried over. So, um, but a lot of times stuff like that doesn't, um, you know, that won't import directly and those standards and are kind of evolving constantly. Okay, so we have a question it says, uh, hi, great tip um, regarding moving clips. I'm just uh, switching to Nuendo from Pro Tools where I'm nudging clips all the time. Is there a way to do this in Nuendo? So if you wanted to nudge, you know, there is kind of a nudge palette. So once you come over here, you could say, okay, now that we have, um, so let, let me just come over here. You know, so you could just say, okay, I wanted to move these events. So just kind of like what we were doing, you could also choose to uh, trim the end or beginning. So if you wanted to just, you know, as we come over here and there's keyboard shortcuts for all of these. So let's say So at this point, you know, so we could move the events like this. We could also just truncate the beginning, or we could just trim the end or trim the end to the right. So you could do all this kind of nudging directly there. So just go to like the settings and then you know, just go to the nudge palette and you can do that based on the grid settings. All right, so, um, okay, so we just see uh, the way you showed me was set to the grid value, right? I want to nudge by samples if possible. So, you know, if you come over here, you know, you could have a, uh, a master, you know, and a secondary time. So let's say if I just wanted to nudge by, you know, so I'm going to hit the period key, like just a little bit over and to the right on my numeric, on my computer keyboard. And that could switch between like bars and beats and your secondary time position. So let's say if I just wanted to nudge something by 10 samples, I could come over here and say, okay, I want to use the quantize value. When I come to my secondary, and again, that's just a period key on a computer keyboard. And now when I nudge, and we could watch kind of the value here. So I'll hit the period key. And now when I go to nudge, we could see that the start and end positions will just be based. So I could do all my editing in bars and beats and switch to samples. Or if I want it, if I'm doing more traditional posts, I could say I want it time code. So I could have, if I wanted to adjust by one frame, you know, I could take this event here, adjust by one frame. I want to go to samples, hit period, and then my nudge value, I can just set to one sample or to 10 samples. 
And so once again, period. And they retain their different uh, grid types when you switch between primary and secondary display format. So then you could nudge in different times very easily. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, for some reason, my sustain pedal has been assigned to some sort of command that pans the first track available in Cubase hard right. How can I find that command list and remove it? So it's probably gonna be set up maybe in a generic remote or maybe something like a Mackie control. So if we go to your studio menu, go to studio setup, and then at that point, um, go to like your generic remote and you'll probably see that, uh, like sustain pedal, like control name, maybe set up for like controller 64 or whatever. So you would see that your, the MIDI message is probably going through a remote controller that's setting the particular, uh, values. So you could, you know, choose to delete this, you may have like a Mackie control set to all MIDI inputs, as opposed to like a dedicated port where stuff like this could happen. Um, so that's probably where that MIDI message is actually uh, sneaking in. So, and causing the, the panning to be adjusted. Okay, so we just see uh, a question slash feature request. Can it please become possible for snapping in the project window to be relative to the zoomed out level? Uh, I've seen this humbly requested before. So it kind of does that already. So there is, so let's say I'm at bars and beats here. Um, so we could come over here and we see the grid setting for adapt uh, adapt to zoom. So right now at this level, um, I'm going to, let's, I'll just move this to, okay. So right now at this point, um, let's say I'll just move this event here to, and it's going to snap to half notes. So if I zoom out a little bit, uh, it'll j just allow us to zoom at half notes. So let's say I go out a little more. At this point, it's just gonna be at the bar. We zoom in and now I could snap to quarter notes, zoom in further, it will snap. So as we do this, it's gonna snap to eighth notes. We zoom in 16th notes. So all you have to do is set the grid to adapt to zoom level. Um, so you do that and then as you zoom in now, it will just kind of automatically follow your, your grid settings based upon your zoom setting. So we thought it was a cool thing too and that's why they added it. All right, so just see a uh, question. Hi, Greg, recorded old Atari songs into Cubase by MIDI in, but the sync wonders uh, out of time, so the MIDI doesn't line up in time. How do I fix this after the fact? Um, okay, so I guess you took the output of the Atari. Um, okay, so... Um, so, uh, you know, I, if you could, uh, I'm not sure if you actually were synchronized, you, like if you did like a MIDI time code synchronization between the two, or if you just kind of uh, freewheeled it. But, you know, if you have, uh, you know, if you have Cubase set 
to resolve to time code. So we could come over here, go to the transport to the project synchronization settings. And you know, you could just have Cubase like, you know, come over here and say activate external sync and look for MIDI time code. And that way the two will be resolved to each other. So I'm not sure if you just kind of, you know, hit play in one or if it was actually uh, synchronizing via MIDI time code. So Okay. Okay, so just see with this snap to grid says uh I meant on a macro level as a, so he zoomed out in the whole project, the whole arrangement and then it still snaps to single bars. So I think, you know, it's going to be single bars will be the highest um range, but let's say if I have this if So I think it might be the highest level might be the measure when you're using kind of uh, using the adapt to zoom. Okay, so I know we had a couple of questions. Let's get to some of those before. Um, thanks for all the great questions that people have asked. All right, sorry, let me mute. All right, sorry, just using the adapt to zoom. All right. Um, okay, so I know we had a couple of questions. Let's get this. All right, let me just turn my volume down my monitoring computer. Sorry about that. Questions that people have asked. Okay. Um, all right, so we have a question how to click in the project window to set the playback position. So, a lot of times, uh, when people are here and they want to play back starting right here, they click and they could select the event. So, you know, we could now, there's an option for click to, uh, click on empty space, but let me just show a different scenario. So let's say if we're back on this project where we have data kind of all through the project and we don't have empty spaces. All right, so, so if I come here and I want to navigate to an empty space, we, we could click on an empty space, but if there's an event there, um, and I'll show you the preference for, so let's say it might be under editing, uh, Maybe project and mix console for click on empty space, uh, maybe under transport. So uh, locate when clicked on empty space. But if I wanted to navigate to click exactly where I was, we could come over here to the preferences. I believe that this is set by default in Cubase, but maybe not Nuendo. Um, I just ran into this with uh, Jim Messina from Loggins and Messina over the weekend. But if I wanted to go to my tool modifiers and you go to the select tool, there will be a set position. So we could say, I just wanted to go to option plus shift. So now as I play, I can hold down option or alt plus shift. And now as you click, it'll just navigate directly there as opposed to selecting the event. So now that's how you could navigate freely. So by default, it'll be alter option plus shift, but if that doesn't work, or if you wanted to change the modifier, just come over here to editing, to tool modifiers, to select tool, and you'll see a set position, and then you could change that there.
All right, so we had a question. Uh, can you explain what the different colors mean in Vario Audio when the segment color is set to chord track slash pitch? Okay, so let's go ahead. mouse battery may have died. Let me just um, adjust a couple things here real quick. I'll open up my trackpad. All right, so. All right, so when we have a very audio, we could come over here and just say, All right, so I'm gonna have my chord track. And we'll go to our chord track, we'll say create chord symbols. So now when we go into Vary Audio, I'll just make it large here so we can see it a little easier. And we have the color scheme set to chord track. All right, so we see green notes, we'll see red notes and blue notes. So green notes means that those segments fall within the chord. Uh, blue notes mean that this is within the scale. You may, all, or just, we'll call it an aqua. Uh, and then you may see a bright blue note and a bright blue note indicates that that note is within the chord, but, that, but the note is not within the scale that's been determined. And then you'll see red notes and red notes are out of key and out of scale. So you think red, bad. Um, so kind of easy stuff to remember with that. All right, and we had a question. Um, did Cubase get its name from the process of arranging slash scoring cues in performance with early sequencer software? So um, I remember talking with Manfred Rurup, uh, who is one of the founders of Steinberg. It was him and he and Charlie Steinberg were the founders. And last time I was in Hamburg, I think 2019, uh, you know, I always try to make it a point to go out and get lunch with him. And we're just kind of talking about a lot of early stuff. So I think originally they were trying to call it Qubit. Um, but around the same time that they were doing, there was a computer game. Uh, I think I remember the arcade game that was called Qubit. So, you know, they kind of had the whole program and they're ready to do the whole, this is a story. Uh, I was told. So they're ready to kind of do the whole marketing push and a couple of days before they just randomly picked Cubase uh, from Qubit. So that's how the name um, Cubase came about. So, all right, I'll just come back to some of the live questions. Sorry, my mouse that I'm using just died on me, so. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Will my Cubase 7 artist projects load into the latest Cubase? Yes, yeah, so you can go back to Cubase SX1 uh, and those file formats or Nuendo 1 from 1999, they will uh, load up, no problems. All right, we see Gareth has made the live stream. I'm so glad you can make it. I hope you got the baseline. Okay, so you see Gareth got the baseline. Hope it was okay. All 
Okay, uh, so we see a uh, question uh, in the mixer screen. Um, there's a drop down menu uh, with a choice uh, EQ. Just make sure. Um, so you just see in the mixer screen, there's a drop down choice of the menu choice for EQ filter transition, uh, hard or soft. What EQ are they talking about? The channel EQ uh, on the inspector. So yes, that is with the channel EQ. So we, Gareth is asking if I had a hamburger while I was having lunch in Hamburg. So I think we actually did have hamburgers that day. So, but it was nice. But it, it, there is a lot of seafood in Hamburg as well. Okay, so we see, uh, what does the audio performance meter actually mean? I'm in a Ryzen 5950 with 128 gigs of RAM, and even when I'm in a fully light project, the meter is above 50%. So it could really depend, you know, a lot of times people may run one instrument and load up like 20 sounds in one instrument. And if you, you're doing it in one instrument, that could, you know, basically, you know, many instruments will only utilize one CPU core. So that as you're playing back multiple sounds within a single instrument, you could be, you know, so it's showing your audio real time performance. So, you know, as you're doing, you know, it, as plugins don't scale across multiple CPUs, depending on how they're used, that could give you kind of a high ratings, like high CPU or a high audio performance meter settings. Um, when you think that you shouldn't be expecting it. Um, so I just see, uh, Greg, what part of Cubase have you lately found unexpected depth? Um, I think, you know, I was working on device panels with someone and, you know, it's not something that's as popular today, but you know, there's a lot of stuff you could do with that. But yeah, I'm always discovering new things and you know, I generally will learn something new on every live stream. All right, so with that, we're gonna we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for all of the wonderful questions. We'll see you on Friday. And again, next Tuesday we'll have our Zoom meetup slash Christmas party. So I wanna uh I'll have different op different um I'll have the Zoom meetup info for Friday's live stream, but everyone, please stay safe and healthy. And um, I just see your quick question. Uh, how often are the live streams? We do it Tuesdays and Fridays. We'll take some time off for the holidays, but we do it twice a week. So with that, we'll end the live stream. Everyone, please stay safe and healthy. Goodbye.